Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro, thanks for tuning in. We're beginning to see mask mandates return right before the CDC says they expect the new COVID shots to be available next month. Is the timing just a coincidence or part of their rollout strategy? It wasn't long ago when they told us we needed to shut everything down for two weeks to flatten the curve. Then two weeks turned into two months and two months turned into two years. The mask mandates paved the way for the vax mandates and millions of people were faced with perhaps the most difficult decision of their life. To roll up their sleeve or lose their job and their ability to keep a roof over their family's head and put food on the table. It was a dark day for America and a dark day for humanity. Joining me now to share his story is musician and drummer Pete Parada. Welcome Pete, thanks for coming. Hey, thank you for having me. Pete. You were living the dream, a professional musician, making a living, doing what you love to do, a literal rock star, traveling the world, playing drums for the offspring. But you found yourself faced with perhaps the biggest decision of your life, T take the COVID shot or lose your job and get kicked out of the band. Walk us through what happened. Yeah, I mean, in summer of 2021, you know, the music industry was faced with a dilemma of you know, we told everyone to stay home for a year and a half um, and that it's unsafe to go out and fear, fear, fear. Like, how do we unring that bell? And, you know, Live Nation and the powers that be seem to think that calling things fully vaccinated tours were, were the way out. That was the escape. So, you know, everyone just sort of picked up on it. So I knew it was going to be an issue for me. And, you know, we had had some conversations that I thought we were at least moving in a direction of like, oh, we can figure this out. And then, you know, late June 21, I just got a call from the band's manager and was just absolutely like a flamethrower in my face, just abusive, threatening, belittling, just, I mean, I was called everything from, you know, a pussy and, you know, um, you know, you're afraid to do this to I'm a bad person for not being a part of the greater good to like, it didn't matter, you know, that I had a medical exemption, didn't care. And, you know, so it was just really kind of shocking. And, you know, he made it clear in no uncertain terms that I was to get the shot or I would be replaced. And, you know, so I took that to the guys in the band and said, hey, you know, got this call that was you know, crazy out of line. Here's my, here's where I'm at with things. Here's my reasonings for not wanting to do this. They took the manager's side and it just kind of came to an impasse where I would, you know, nothing that I said seemed to make a difference. And, you know, so things deteriorated pretty quickly after that, within a matter of days, um, I was just kind of cut off from everything, you know, and then I found out I was replaced from my Southwest flight app when I checked to, my flight to rehearsal and it was canceled. And then later on that day, I was from my access to the band's work calendar was revoked. So just kind of ghosted and cut off and left hanging like myself, my family from these people that, you know, we had been together for 14 years. Like we were good friends. We traveled the world. Our wives were good friends. Our kids grew up together. And it was just overnight, it was just like, now you're, you're gone, you know? So it's, it, to me, it was just kind of a bit of a shock. I was in some disbelief of like, I don't understand how this is happening. I don't understand how this all unraveled so quickly, but, you know, you kind of come to find out that everyone likes to say that we're all family and we're all part of a team and we're all in it together. But when, as soon as you say no to someone, you find out where you stand, you know, I, I'd never had any issues with the band. We always had a good time on tour. Like I did everything I was ever asked. Like this was really the first time I had to put my foot down and say, no, I, I can't do this. It's not right. I have a medical exemption. It didn't matter. And like, and so, you know, I waited about a month kind of waiting to see what would happen. Like, is this, is this really what's going on? I'm, I'm done. And, um, so we put out, you know, I, I decided, well, number one, I don't have a job anymore. So I need to let people know I'm looking for work. Number one, you know, I'm not, I'm a touring musician. We're not financially stable people. You know, I didn't, I wasn't there for the heyday. I, I wasn't there for the big hits, you know? So when you're just a hired guy touring, you got to keep touring. So number one, I had to put out the word that I was looking for work. Number two, they were about to go on tour, even coming through where I live in Nashville, and I'm getting hit up by people for tickets to these shows that I know I'm not going to be at anymore. 
And I didn't want to have this conversation, you know, a thousand times with different people. So we just figured best to just let people know why I won't be there, where I'm at with things. And and to say, you know, not just from my position of why I'm not doing it, but that this isn't right. You know, that if they're leaning on me, they're leaning on everybody. And, you know, I I sort of thought if I can't stand up here and, and show my kids like, hey, there's no opportunity, whether it's a job or, you know, even your financial stability, that you're going to give up your bodily sovereignty and that your your own rights, you know, it's it's so much easier to fight to keep the rights you have than to fight to get them back once you've given them up. And so it was kind of like, all right, I'm not I'm not going to do a fake card, which was suggested and floated part of the conversation. And, you know, and I have to say something because this isn't right. And even if I'm going to get torched, which is what I expected, would just be scorched earth the end of my career. You know, it was like we have to say something because somebody's got to say something. I had talked to plenty of people in the industry that were a lot of guys on fake cards, a lot of people, you know, in my position getting told, hey, you get it or you're out. And they would they just kind of left and didn't say anything, hoping that, you know, when the dust settled, they could just go back to doing what they did. And to me, it was like, if somebody doesn't say something, then this is going to keep happening and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And so, you know, we put the statement out. It was, I didn't say anything bad about the band. It was just, here's what happened. They're doing what they feel is best. I'm doing what I feel is best. You know, that's all there is to it. And the reaction to it was crazy. It was people from all around the world sending me messages going, oh my God, I thank you for saying something. I thought I was the only person that felt this way. And I realized it was like, oh, you know, the people in charge of this want everyone to feel like they're the only person that feels this way. Because when you say something about it, you know, your your reach gets throttled, everything gets throttled, your account will get taken down. You have to be very careful if you won't go along with the narrative. You're like, they're not going to give you any reach there. And But it was really uplifting to have so many strangers from every walk of life all around the world and tons of musicians, tons of actors and actresses, people reaching out going, hey, I don't feel good about this either. But, you know, I'm I'm worried to say something. I don't want to get blacklisted. And and I get it like it's not speaking up like this isn't for everybody. You know, I, it's a beating and it's lonely because you're kind of just hanging out there for everyone to come and and, you know, throw their whatever they want at you. But, you know, the, the, the time at the time, it was really hard. I mean, certainly hard on me and my family and, and my wife and kids really got me through that period because I was, I was a wreck. Like I was like my whole, everything I've ever done is in service to music and playing the drums. And now I can't do it. Like this is taken away And the way that the industry was acting. It looked like it would, I'd never be allowed to. And so it was really debilitating. But then I started getting, you know, within a few weeks, the band is out playing shows and festivals and other bands on these shows are writing to me going, dude, we're not vaccinated. Nobody's asking for papers here. Like, why are you not here? This is this is crazy. Like, and I'm just like, I don't, I don't not my call. You know, I'm, I'm not in charge here. You know, it was do it or we'll replace you. And I was as as their manager suggested, I would be easily replaced. And I was. And it, ultimately, I don't. I don't think it's important. It's not a big deal who's playing drums on Pretty Fly for a white guy. Like that's that's not the thing, but it's it's every incremental erosion of our rights here, it's hard to get back. And, you know, and the fact that it's creeping back in now with this new terrifying scary variant is you know, it's disheartening because the last couple months I feel like a lot of people have been coming around to the state of things and and saying like hey wow yeah that was messed up well i got i got swept up in that well i'm not going to do it again Uh, you know i got carried away and then other people who were real vocal about shaming people and belittling and you know cutting people out of their lives they all just want to move on it's like why are you still talking about this we get it whatever you you know you were right about some stuff and you got lucky or whatever let it go COVID's over and it's just like I'm not letting it go because I don't want it to happen again. And this is the test of it happening again. Like they're, you know, mask mandates are showing back up at universities and hospitals. And, you know, the next thing it'll be on airplanes, the next thing. And 
you know, and there's arguments with people that are like, well, it's it's just a mask. And if it can help somebody and, you know, it, it can't possibly hurt. And I'm like, that's not the point. Exactly right. Exactly right, Pete. Uh, and, and it is uh, beginning to creep back in. Uh, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, but getting back to, you know, I mean, like you said, you were with the offspring for 14 years. You're, you were friends with them. Their families were, you know, your families were friends, everything like that. I mean, that's a long time to be with somebody. And then for them to, to just ghost you uh, like that and not even, I mean, did they even give you an, a, an official statement? But also I, I wanted to ask you and point out, uh, I agree with you 100% on... Uh, not going the route of getting the fake cards. I mean, everybody was kind of talking about that. We we had seen some of that. And to me, in my own opinion, that just kind of continues uh, the illusion that, you know, people are going along with this. You know, it's like, you know, rather than fake it to go along just to keep your job, you know, you know, and keep going along with it. Um, I, I felt that it was important, you know, for myself, if I was put in that position, to yes, we have to draw the line. Like, hey, we're not going along with this. I'm not even going to fake going along with this. Um, but uh, so they didn't even uh, they you, they just ghosted you like that, huh? I mean, did this essentially ruin your friendship uh, with the members of Offspring? Uh, do you still have you talked to them? Uh, you know, I... no. I mean, once once I said no, that was it. It was just like radio silence. Wow. You know, nothing. So, and you know, I don't know if they were worried like, oh, we're, we're going to stop communication. He's going to try to sue us. Like I'm, I'm from a small town. We don't sue people. We, you know, we, we settle our differences or we move on with our lives. Like I understand that it was business. You know, I don't know that that makes it any better how it all ended that, you know, there was nothing personal in there. It was just, well, we need to go make money and you're going to make it harder on us. And, you know, I know plenty of people that were that were touring on uh, medical exemptions like I had, but they're all singers, right? They're all vocalists. No one's making special arrangements for the drummer, you know, certainly not managers who don't really don't give a shit about drummers in general. We're all just, you know, faceless, replaceable people. And so, you know, I, I get that they needed to get back to work, but my point was there's a way to do this. There's a way we can make it happen. And I thought that they were jumping really far ahead to some conclusions that just weren't true. You know, there was there was not one venue in the U.S. that fall of 2021 that I could not have played at. There was there was no reason for me not to be there. Now, could I go to England with them November that year? No, no, I would have needed paperwork for that. And, you know, so maybe someone could have covered that tour and we would have seen where things ended. But it was just... It was, you know, get on board or we'll find someone who will. And that's it. The consequences are on you either way. And, you know, so it's while it's disappointing that that's how it ended. And then you kind of question like, oh, wow, I, were we friends? Was there anything here? Or was it just I, it was convenient that I was such a nice, compliant person and just, you know, did my job, followed the script, didn't make waves? We'll never know. But um, it was it, it was hard to for it to just be overnight like oh that's a no wow. that's that so. wow and the offspring was asked about this uh situation with you in an interview uh, i'm sure you have seen the clip i haven't i don't follow anything that they're doing because my my heart can't take it like uh, like i don't want to be in a place of like ang anger or bitterness or anything it's just once that was severed it's no longer my business and me me tracking stuff down like I will pop my head up to correct the record when I hear stories that are uh, that are not accurate but other than that I've largely left them alone and so how did you manage to provide for your family in that time like when, when that happened like when your whole world was literally crashing down your career that you've been doing for 14 years all of a sudden came to an abrupt end with no well, explanation. 25 years, just 14 with them. But yeah, we had to pivot. I mean, we drastically curtailed our lifestyle down to the absolute essentials. You know, we just kind of, my wife and my daughters sort of, we're like a team, like a little gang and we do everything together and we make decisions together. And so it was like, we're going to have to knuckle down. We're going to have to find a new way. And, and we did, you know, thankfully, for as many people that ran away from me that were close friends and things like that or just kind of distanced and, you know, there was a real handful of people that ran towards me and like, hey, what can I do? How can I help? Like Tim Poole was a huge advocate for my story 
and what went on. And, and uh, you know, when I talked to him, he was just like, hey, come on out. Just let me fly out here for the weekend. Let's hang out. Let's talk about music and whatever. And, you know, I didn't know that he was a songwriter and a singer and a guitar player. And so we just started working on music together, you know, through that. So that kind of got me going. A good friend of mine who I hadn't, you know, talked to in a while came right out of the woodwork and was like, hey, you got to get back to playing drums. Let's start a project together. You know, so people kind of came in, you know, I, I put up on my website that my my studio here where I record drums for people is up and running. So thankfully, a lot of people hired me to play drums on their tracks. And and so little by little, we are able to piece it together to where you know, now I've got a, a good system going. I'm tracking drums for people. I've, I've made a producer sound pack full of drum loops and, and sounds for the Splice Company. I'm finishing up my second pack for them right now. Um, I've filled in on some tours with people. Like, you know, it's we're making it work. And, you know, now I have my new band, uh, The Defiant, which we can talk about in a little bit too. But it's it's really been kind of an, a real pendulum swing from how dark that was two years ago now of just, I mean, I was catatonic, you know, there was a stretch of weeks where my wife or one of my daughters was, had eyes on me all the time. Like it was, it was sketchy. It was dark. Like I was, I was not good. I was not well. And, uh, you know, but they got me through it. My friends got me through it. And this whole groundswell of support from people I didn't know just all showed up. You know, like, what can we do or let us support? And and it was really kind of a beautiful experience to be like, oh, all right, like, this isn't the end of anything. And, and you know, it was a nice lesson about cancel culture that the, the outrage mob comes and, you know, they're coming for everybody at this point, but it comes fast and it burns fast and it moves on to somebody else. And you got to stand your ground and wait it out. And the thing is, like, nobody can cancel you if you don't accept their terms. If you're just like, I'm not going to stop creating. I'm not going to stop making music. I'm not going to stop working with artists that I enjoy. And I'm not going to stop living my life or start living it in fear because it's something that, you know, all these other people want. And so to, to me, the, the big problem with the mandates that were, you know, crashing at that time, why I felt like I needed to say something is because the a mandate absolutely leaves no room for nuance in any conversation. It's just like, well, no, everyone has to do this. And that's all there is to it. And I think a lot of people still kind of quite don't understand where I'm coming from because my position is very nuanced. Like I didn't take the vaccine for medical reasons. I didn't take the card, the fake card for ethical reasons, but I spoke out for personal reasons. And I think that's a lot for uh, anyone to juggle who's looking into this going, well, what's this guy talking about? And what, you know, what's his problem? Why is he still going on about this? But I'm still going on about it because if there's no accountability, if there's no, the people that put all these mandates in place for no reason that did nobody any good, it was terrible for the economy, terrible for kids in school, terrible for people's health. Um, I mean, loneliness, depression, alcoholism, all through the roof, drug use, like, the lockdowns were a, ca a catastrophe and I don't want it to happen again. And until I feel like there's some accountability out there of like, oh yeah, that was wrong. Oh, we'll, we'll course correct. We won't do that again, but it doesn't look like anyone learned anything and they're going to just try to roll everything back out. And so to me, even that Atlantic article a few months back that was like, oh, we need a COVID amnesty. We all said things that we regret. And it's like, I didn't. You know, I, everything I said has come to pass. So a, anybody who's just like, oh, well, let's all just move on and act like it never happened. That's because they were, you know, probably pretty shitty to a bunch of people coercing and bullying. And, you know, you see so many people screaming at everyone online to get vaccinated, wear your mask, get in line. You're ruining this for everyone. And, and, and just even the coercion campaign worldwide, which was the scary thing for me, you know, the day that it became a pandemic of the unvaccinated that traveled like wildfire around the world. Like every world leader got their marching orders that day that now this is this is our talking point. So the, the whole thing was just super sketchy. And, you know, if if your solution requires coercing people with cheeseburgers or donuts or lottery tickets or lap dances or, or whatever else to go get this thing, you know, that's have a have a better argument than if you if you have to 
you know, go to coercion, then there's there's a problem going on. Absolutely. Uh, but meanwhile, they would say, trust the science, you know, uh, and until the science changed, right? until the science changed <laughs> over and over. And then even redefining uh, terms like uh, scientific terms like uh, what is a vaccination and what is a pandemic? It just like we saw them do. And we also saw how the mask mandates quickly led to the vax mandates. And now we are, as you mentioned previously, beginning to see the mask mandates start to creep back in right before the new COVID shot comes out. Do you think right, that right the, as Pfizer's profits have dipped, you know, 25, 30 percent? Absolutely. And that's the thing with the, with the mask mandates when people are like, it's just a mask. I'm like, but the mask mandate paved the way for leaning on everyone for vaccine mandates. And and to me, that that's the thing. Even if the vaccine had been perfect and it helped everyone, it still would not have been OK to mandate it on people like you have to leave room for you know, this isn't for everyone. There's not a one size fits all, especially on some new technology that's not tested very well. And even, I mean, I still have this screenshot that my wife took uh, January 19, 2021 from the CDC website and the little bit of data that they had put out. And it says, while we did not test this product for trans to see if it stopped transmission, we are hopeful that, you know, that that's you know, we'll see down the line some sort of like that was it. We didn't test it for transmission. We hope it'll work that. But that's not what they said on television. Right. That's because everyone just gets to say whatever the hell they want. But where they where they had to speak somewhat truthfully, they you know, so I took a, or she took a screen grab of that that we still have. I posted it online a couple months ago and people were like, that's a fake screenshot. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you like that. This is this is the data they put out. And I ran it by all kinds of people at the time and nobody had a good answer for it. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. They were making it up as they went and, and moved the goalposts and everything like that and would say on, on the news through their, uh, you know, sponsored programs that it was 97 percent effective or whatever like that. But uh, and then it started dropping and dropping and dropping. But even that, like, they, you know, they tested off of or they went with relative risk reduction, which is largely worthless in the grand scheme of things, where the absolute risk reduction showed that it you know, was less than one percent. It was basically the same as your chances of dying from catching the virus. So it was like, what is the point of this if the absolute risk reduction is basically equal to if you have a if you're a you know have a bunch of comorbidities and you're in danger of the virus taking you out absolutely um pete i have a question for you do you think that the public would react differently this time if they really try to push this covid 1984 agenda again like they did previously we're about to find out um but i i think i mean i've already heard stories already of people pushing back. And a lot of people that I see online are like, nope, absolutely not, not doing it again, you know, fool me once. And, you know, I've had a lot of people have written to me that are like, hey, you know, I took the shot or I took two doses or, or I got the first booster, but I, it all feels hinky. I don't feel good about it. I'm not sure what to do. And I think there's enough people, hopefully, that will will make a pushback. You know, I heard of a, a commercial shoot a friend of mine was telling me about in LA the other day where there was like 70 people on set. So they started trying to make everyone wear masks and show their vax card. And if you're unvaccinated, you had to wear a mask and all the people banded together and said no. And the production dropped it. And it's like, yeah, when when we, somebody pushes back and says something, it makes a difference. You know, I had I had someone say to me a few months ago, like, you know, you're all, all these terrible things happened to you and you lost so much here. Was it why? Why was it even worth it? Did you even make a difference? And I'm just like, that's it's missing the point of whether I made a difference. I'm a pretty small, insignificant person in this world. But, you know, the, the two people that were my target audience, my daughters, it made a difference. Like they got to see, you know, once kids are teenagers, it doesn't matter what you say to them anymore. They only watch your actions. And so I felt like I needed to show them like, yep, this is a firing squad. We're about to get, you know, taken down, but we're going to come through it. We're going to come out on the other side. And, and you, you do stand up for yourself, especially when it comes to your body. And, and there's no opportunity that's worth sacrificing that. 100% Pete. And you didn't give in, you stood your ground and you came out on top. I mean, despite not knowing what the outcome would be going into it. You know, that says a lot about who you are. And, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, yes, we do need to 
to stand our ground. What What is your message to people who may be faced with a similar situation in the future? Hey, that's a tough one because I, like I said earlier, I, I, making this stand is not for everybody. And I understand that everybody's situation is different. And however, I don't have any judgment on however anybody navigated all this. If you got swept up into the fear, I understand that. If you had no choice you, and you had to keep your job and, you know, you, or you had to get a fake card to not lose your job, like all, all valid reasons and, and any no about this is valid there. You don't need an excuse. And no is a complete sentence. Like I'm not taking this. I don't want it. Um, so I, I would hope that this time more people can see, you know, it is scary. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have a bunch of people yelling at you for a few days and you're going to, you're going to have to withstand that. And it, it's hard. I mean, I'm a, like I said, I'm a pretty compliant person. So this was, this was growing a new muscle for me to say no to this and to, and to stand up for it. And, um, so I, I would hope at this point that there's enough people that can say, no, for me personally, that's a no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not, I'm not going back into the mask again. I'm not doing another booster. You know, we're, we're all, we've all been living with this just fine the last year, you know, new variant or not. Um, it's, it's time to just keep living our lives and not be shutting down schools and businesses. I mean, so much was lost already. I really hope enough people can not even making a huge stand, just the little stands, you know, oh, that business is forcing you to, to wear a mask or you have to get out and get out. Take your stands where you can. And, you know, that every little bit makes a difference. You know, like we can't have our I am Spartacus moment unless more people start, you know, the first people stand up and say it, you know, you got to so it's got to start somewhere. But I, I think there's a, a much larger movement of people that are fed up and they're not they're not going to follow orders this time. It certainly appears that way. Lots of people seem to be upset about how they were uh, lied to and uh you know everything that we went through for the past several years, couple of years here. Uh Pete, I I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Uh, I know millions of people went through that as well. I do admire your courage and your conviction to stand behind your beliefs no matter the cost and and you you did what you felt was right, and you were willing to uh, make a, a sacrifice that is very difficult for people to to come to that decision. Uh, and you know what? Sometimes things happen for a reason. As they say, you know, the, the universe can work in mysterious ways. Uh, but before we wrap it up, uh, please tell us about your new projects and your new band, The Defiant, uh, where people yeah. can find you and your music and, and your future projects that you have working on. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, throughout all of this, part of the the good thing about being so out there and open and available about stuff is that you get phone calls from, you know, different people like Dickie Barrett from the Mighty Mighty Boston's hit me up and said, hey, saw your story. And I was like, I saw yours. And he's like, I kind of feel like we should work on something together. And he says, you know, do you know Greg Camp from Smash Mouth? And I said, I don't know him. I've never met him, but I'm obviously aware of his songwriting and his guitar playing. And he's like, I got this idea that I think the three of us would work well together. And I don't know why, but you know, Greg's in Nashville too. Let's, let's get you guys together. Let's start writing. And then, you know, as the process moves along, he says, he goes, I'm going to bring in Johnny Rio from the street dogs to play bass. And I'm like, oh, that's, I mean, for a drummer to play with a bass player like that, that's a dream. Like Johnny's awesome. And then Dickie starts writing songs with Joey LaRocca from the band, the Briggs. And all these songs are rolling in. And I'm like, God, that guy can write a song. Like, all right, cool. And then it just was like, well, why don't we see if he wants to be the fifth and round out the sound? You know, he plays guitar and keyboards. He can sing. And so this whole thing just started taking shape about a year ago. And we started sending files back and forth and writing songs. And everyone, as everybody added their part to it and passed it along, it really started forming into something special and exciting. And for me, it was really unexpectedly exciting because I hadn't felt that creative in a long time. You know, my my other gig was very much, you know, you're at the mercy of one person's whims at all times and there's a script and you follow it and whatever. You don't really bring yourself there. So it had been a while since I really felt like I had permission and a little bit of room to run. So I, I love listening to this record because all the drums I did here in my studio and it was just very freeing. It was like, I'm just going to see what happens. A lot of first inspiration, first takes, let's go with spontaneity and not overthink everything. 
and, you know, beat all the life out of it. And so it's very exciting, you know, to finally have our first single came out uh, a week ago, last Friday, Dead Language. And um, it's got a really good response, which is great. And I, I think it's been a nice surprise for people who, you know, we've been talking about the band all year, but we hadn't had any music out yet. And so I think when people heard it, it wasn't what they were expecting, because I think it was like, oh, these, you know, a couple of these guys really went through the ringer the last couple of years. They're going to be super angry. And it's not angry music. It's not. I mean, we are singing about things that have happened and in, in our experience with it. But the whole purpose of the project and the band is unity. It's about bringing people back together. Like we're tired of everyone being divided. We're tired of, you know, even when somebody like Oliver Anthony puts that song out and it's just a beautiful song from this guy singing from his heart. And, but some, but all of a sudden immediately it had to be made political. And it was like, well, you can only like it if you're in this box. And if you're in this box, you're not allowed to. And I'm like, what the hell happened to music and art and all of us that we we can't even like something now if our team says to, not to like where's so like nuance has just been destroyed across the board but i think that you know people like oliver and you know bands like us and people like rfk junior are showing that there's a huge bunch of people out there that are tired of it and they refuse to be pigeonholed into this side or that side They've got a lot of nuanced positions. They don't agree with everyone on anything, which is awesome. Like, I don't I don't mind talking to people who disagree with me as long as it's civil. I'm That's where I'm going to learn something. I might change my positions and I might be able to help them change theirs. But, you know, if somebody wants to come at me strictly committed to misunderstanding me and my positions, that's a waste of time. But and also, if we're in a bubble and we only talk to people that agree with us on everything, then no one's learning anything. We're dumber because of it because we're just recycling and going yeah yeah okay but i get how people have gotten caught up in that in the last five years because it seems specific like divide and conquer get everybody so angry every day and you know people wake up like who are we canceling today who are we mad at and you know throwing people out of their lives if you vote this way you're dead to me if you vote that way i don't want to talk to you again i'm like for a bunch of politicians that don't give a shit about you like that's it, it's crazy to me so this band, all that to say, this band is about bringing people together. All the songs are about unity. Even if we're singing about something that we're upset about, it's like, it's not just plain bitching. It's like, here's this thing that happened. Here's how we feel we should move forward. Let's all find common ground and move forward together. So it's exciting for me to to get this music that I feel good about with these people who I really care about and who I know care about me. You know, I, everything I work on now is is starts with mutual respect. And if if there was any silver lining and blessing out of all of this is realizing that I don't ever want to be back in a position where I don't have any power in the situation, where I don't have any say over what the band is doing or, you know, where I don't have a voice in any of it. You know, I'm, I'm not allowed to. So for me, even though it's, you know, certainly financially been a a winding road to keep ourselves afloat here and stuff. I feel like we've, we've got our head above water and we're moving forward in the best way where we've created a space where I feel good about what I'm doing. My family feels good about how we're living. And, you know, it's so much better than waiting for the phone to ring or beholden to somebody else's his whims all the time. So I'm really excited. The whole record will be out October 27th. Um, and before that, we have two more songs that we're going to drop that I think will um, certainly turn some heads, I hope. And uh, But very excited to get that up and running. If anybody's interested in learning more about the band, they can go to thedefiantofficial.com. Um, all our social media links are on there and a little bit about the band. And, you know, we have a YouTube channel with some videos up with each of us doing mini interviews explaining like where we came from and you know who we are how we came together and also the dead language music videos on there too and it's going up on rumble later today as well wow pete that's a uh, it's a, such a great story um especially where you find yourself now compared to where you were before you know i mean it's it sounds liberating like even though you had to go through hell uh, in the unknown and have your world come crashing down around you, you got through it and now you find yourself in a place that you're much, it sounds like you're much happier to be in and much more excited to be in. Uh, so I'm so happy for you, Pete. And I, and I, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be my guest. I look forward to seeing, uh, and hearing more from you and the band in the future. And I wish you guys all the best, man. I really do. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I had a great time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have seen how they operate. We have witnessed the lies and deception firsthand. We were all targeted by their campaign of fear, intimidation, and coercion in an attempt to force people to comply. It is imperative that we stand our ground and not allow our liberties or morals to be sacrificed under any circumstances. Stay tuned for more. Big thanks to my friend and guest, Pete Parada. I'm Spiro. Thanks for watching.